that was the most important day in your life. To me, that was just <laughs> Tuesday. left of philosophy. I'm Owen. And here with me today is Gil. Hello. Will. What's up? And Lillian. Hey, Owen. Hey. So the broad subject of today's podcast is colonialism. And to guide this conversation, we're going to be discussing the anti-colonial thought of Aimé Césaire. Césaire is known and read for a wide array of contributions to 20th century intellectual, artistic, and political life. But we've decided today to, to focus on his 1950 discourse on colonialism, as well as his 1956 letter to Maurice Torres, which was his letter of resignation to the French Communist Party. So we're going to hopefully discuss a number of topics, like Césaire's attack on, uh, on liberal humanism. I wanted to hopefully discuss to um, the kind of contemporary resonance of the discourse. Uh, but I, I thought we might start by trying to get a bit more specific about what is one of the core theses, if not the main kind of core thesis of the discourse, which is that Nazism, Nazism, fascism in general, and World War II can be explained as a kind of boomerang effect of the colonial project on the colonizing countries and peoples themselves. He claims that as brutal as colonialism is to the colonized, it also brutalizes and even, mut and even mutilates the colonizer. It decivilizes the colonizer, turns them into a barbarian. And that barbarism that Europe and the West cultivated for centuries reaches its logical conclusion in Hitler and the unleashing of a murderous violence, which was practiced and refined on the non-white peoples of the world. So that's the kind of, I take that to be the kind of big claim, one of the central claims of the, uh, of the discourse. And I thought that maybe just by way of giving context for those of you that haven't read the piece yet, um, we might just discuss this general claim before we get into some of the more, um, yeah, some of the more kind of specifics of the resignation letter and some of the arguments from the discourse. So how do you guys read that, that, uh, that claim? It's obviously a controversial claim because there are a number of things, you know, there's endless debate about what the sources of fascism were and on the left you know various ways of trying to tie it to class and to capitalism to the interests of the german bourgeoisie or you know a number of different places but i thought i'd start by trying to you know discuss and get specific on this uh, on this claim about the boomerang effect of colonialism on the colonizing countries themselves yeah i'll i'll start so I think here's one level where it, it, it it's it's working at, and this might seem obvious given that it's called discourse on colonialism, which is um, the rhetorical level. There's clearly uh, a certain a certain self image of Europe that um, Cesare wants to disrupt, and the self image is the memory of uh, of Nazism as um, an unfortunate thing that is not proper to anything that happened before in Europe. That certainly is not a part of its ideals and has never been manifested in its, in its practices. And so it seems to me, you know, part of what he's trying to do here with this writing is trying to, you know, sort of jar the moral consciousness of Europe saying, your, your hands are bloody far before that moment. And to disrupt the amnesia around what happened outside Europe's borders for many generations. And so if I wanted to put it, you know, more philosophically, it's to disrupt disrupt the sort of um, teleology that Europe has developed for itself from how it remembers the Enlightenment and even back remembers its sort of uh, um, philosophical authority arising from Greece and all of that, uh, all of that business and say, no, 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 no. Almost like, you know, as you know, Adorno will eventually do, there was a dark side to all of this as well. Though, um, what, what is the date of the myth of, or the dialectic of enlightenment in this? So were they written around the same time? We don't have to like I think it was that, earlier. Right? Dialectic of enlightenment's a little earlier. Yeah. Okay. I think it's the late thirties maybe. Can I ask what, um, like who's the audience for discourse on colonialism? Like this is the kind of thing, like this is the, I've read this a couple of times and for some reason I had this thought now and I didn't before. And I was just curious, like who is he writing for 
Yeah, that's a good question because a lot of it does seem to be addressed at at France and at the French bourgeoisie mm-hmm. and at the French intellectual scene and the people that think that the people that are very comfortable thinking they're at a distance from this great calamity that just happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and other times it does seem like who's being addressed are like, you know, colonized or formerly colonized peoples. But I think a lot of it reads to me like an attack on the kind of French establishment, on the white establishment and on the kinds of stories that they tell themselves about their, you know, about their either sympathy or antipathy for the colonized world or about their, right. um, you know, their their guilt or their complicity uh, in, in those in those atrocities. So, I, yeah, that is a good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot, a lot of like the sort of like heavy lifting done in the actual passages of the text are him quoting white European, primarily French intellectuals, moralists and humanists, like by their own lights, people who understand themselves to be representatives and avatars of this, you know, liberalizing, enlightening, you know, European humanistic tradition. Uh, And then just quoting them saying just horrendous things about the absolutely uh, brutal violence, which they take to be just necessary as uh, something that needs to be like carried out against these colonized peoples. Um, and again, like his point there is like, of course, this violence is, is, is disgusting, but imagine what you have to have gone through in order to think that that is part and parcel of the civilizing mm. mission, so to speak, right? How, how, how twisted your, your way of thinking has to be to be able to make these justifications without any sense of sort of um, irony or without seeing any contradiction there. There are times when he will quote one of those major kind of humanist luminaries or one of those big French libs, and he'll do this huge kind of block quote. And at the end, he'll say, that was Hitler, right? And they're like, no, 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 I'm just j- jokes, jokes, jokes. That was uh, one of your Renan. favorite liberal humanists yeah. that said yeah. all that stuff. I love those moments. <laughs> so I have something from this text that I noticed that was interesting to me. The, when I mean, just speaking of pseudo-humanism and how people if his targets are intellectuals and so on, when he argues that this form, the colonial barbarism dehumanizes even the most civilized man and the, this boomerang effect, um, it strikes me that this is actually like an angle of sort of left-wing critique of colonialism and racism that isn't actually that in- intuitive to people today like the so the idea that there's something to be gained by acknowledging and trying to overcome this pseudo humanism I, I don't know I'm, try, I'm just trying to make sense of it because it, it seems to me that like that was a generation of people that actually saw that no matter how barbaric colonialism is it actually has this like sickening effect on the colonizer and even if like solidarity is not always forthcoming there's this kind of like vision of a real humanism that would like make everyone better off morally and ethically and in a time when I think that some of the dominant mainstream discourse on racism and imperialism is just like you know just assuming that there's nothing to be gained out of like some kind of resolution to this world historic global problem or that it's not possible it just seems to me that these are different registers that mark a shift in how the left thinks about this problem what i you know really like about you know Cesare's argument there is that there is um a, a long tradition of this type of critique where i take the critique being something like frederick Douglass makes this critique in his autobiographies where he says you know sure yes obviously slavery brutalizes black slaves but like look the, at the type of character that has to be formed in order for this to make sense in some sort of coherent and non-contradictory way of what you have to make of yourself. Well, I think I, I you know we you know we can discuss with Cesare, but you know allow this little detour uh, with Frederick Douglass. Well, Frederick Douglass seems to think that you know there is some sort of fundamental sameness we all share when it comes to moral character. That you know we don't have um, a natural disposition towards let's use the moralistic discourse of evil. And so bringing it back to Cesare, I don't know if he holds that position, but he certainly thinks colonialism is not a natural outgrowth of, a, of let's call it human tendencies, and that he yearns for a type of um, solidarity that can happen on the other side of it. And mm-hmm. so for him, it is not about saying, you know, well, forget Europe, we'll have nothing to do with them, we'll go it alone. Even in that interview with um, René Depest, he, you know, he's like... I have been molded 
by French literature. I love Mallarmé. I, I love the French sur surrealists. And so he seems to understand colonialism as an abnormality that uh, needs to be excised, but it isn't an abnormality that's just like, oh, wow, where'd that come from? It's like, well, look at the way you, you formed yourselves. But that is not the way that you um, have to be, if that makes sense. Yeah, he makes frequent <laughs> reference to to what might have been if this weren't the kind of way that Europe made contact with the rest of the world. And there is a kind of, and maybe you can speak to this because I know, Will, you work on utopia, but a kind of utopian energy in his insistence that like it didn't have to be this way. And if it weren't for these particular hierarchical and exploitative structures mutilating our relationship to one another, um, that there might be a, you know, a much richer form of exchange a much richer form of like cultural pluralism than the kind of exoticism that is cultivated in Europe, mm -hmm. et cetera. So yeah, I don't know if, that, if that's something that stood out to you. Absolutely. Oh. <laughs> so direct, again, direct it's one of those, those moments where <laughs> I'm looking at Gil, his mouth starts opening, my mouth starts opening. So um, I just talk, so I'll just say real quickly, I see that as the second part of, of his project. And I wonder what, how important you all think this is. So yes. There are, I won't say it this way, I was gonna say there are aspects of this that date it, but this is a product of its time. And you know, Césaire thinks language is deeply important. And so it seems like he wants to develop a different type of language of how we describe politics and how we describe the possibility of a different social life. And so when he is saying, think about all the institutions that were destroyed, one, he does want to make the case that colonialism was a wound. It didn't have to be this way. And we actually don't even know what these people could have become, but it's worth at least articulating if colonialism has not happened, these institutions might look very different. But two, he wants to yo, um, also configure, well, what is the type of world that we're aiming at? You know, and I think that matters the type of idiom you use to describe what, what emancipation, liberation, or revolution, whatever word you want to use. And he's trying to say, it's not a world of emaciated universalism where we all just become the same magically. But he also doesn't want to say that culture should be a barrier between us, you know, entering into collect in, in the collective action and collective movements. Yeah. Do you feel like there's a tension in his work in the way that he thinks about culture and that kind of like fluid desire for like a better meeting point between different cultures that can in some way heal that wound? Because he talks a lot about like African singularity and I think I think when you said it's a product of its time, I think that that was um, something that people were saying in the sort of nationalist energy that was happening at that period. And so it makes sense. But I wonder if that's an inherent tension in the work. And the reason I'm asking is I do think it kind of points towards latent tensions of cultural essentialism versus desire to make some social progress that we experience today. And I was just reading Paul Gilroy's Against Race again, which I realized I didn't understand at all the first time I read it. And I read it again and I was like, this is like a fantastic book. But he argues that like there's a kind of like what's it? He asks very starkly, like what's at stake in kind of positing something like singularity um, or, you know, eth some kind of ethnic innocence. And obviously he's writing in, in the year 2000. So I don't know what my question is. I feel like that I know that stuck out to me very strongly, a tension between this kind of desire to overcome pseudo-humanism and obviously particularity and difference is important, but he repeats a few times this desire to posit a sort of singularity that actually seems to contrast with the social reality that he's facing and indeed the world that would emerge in the post-colonial period. So it's a kind of a big question but it is the one that I kind of came away with. Like there's so much there in his sort of striving, both poetically and theoretically, to kind of keep the different poles of um, attraction together, or the different tensions. But that moment, the, the sort of cultural singularity moment, I feel like it is there still. Well, one of the things that I think is interesting is that in the discourse, Cesare will say things that like, there actually has not been contact between the cultures of the colonizer and the colonized. Like he talks mm -hmm. about it as like a missed encounter. 
He says, between colonizer and colonized, there is room only for forced labor, intimidation, pressure, the police, taxation, theft, rape, compulsory crops, contempt, mistrust, arrogance, self-complacency, swinishness, brainless elites, degraded masses, no human contact, but relations of domination and submission, which turn the colonizing man into a classroom monitor, an army sergeant, a prison guard, a slave driver, and the indigenous man into an instrument of production. And so like in this context, it makes a lot of sense to me that he would want to insist on, you know, this moment of cultural singularity in as much as this human contact, this form of actual cultural exchange or encounter just has not taken place. And instead, what we've gotten are these like expanding relations of ramified violence and, and depredation, thingification, as he puts it, dehumanization on both sides. At the same time, I think I hear the version of the worry that says that, you know, we want to be careful at the same time not to reify the, the, the singularity of this culture into something hegemonic or monolithic or essentialized in any sort of way, right? But this is, I think, a productive tension, at least in his hands. Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm asking is because he says stuff like that in the discourse, and then he also makes very suggestive comments about how, like, African socialism won't succumb to the same failures of European socialism. He's confident about Chinese social. So there, there's a, a kind of optimism about mm -hmm. this, um, I guess, third world Marxism mm -hmm. that emerges from the hope that a sort of nationalist perspective would bring. And it just, I thought maybe those things were, were related and it's just worth asking, you know, how to think about them in hindsight. Like, I think he had good reasons for being hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, there was a lot happening at the time that makes it, that were particularly inspiring. But I also like stumbled on those passages and I was just like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some didn't age well, which is true about much of the Marxist tradition. No, I mean this is a this is a I think this is a really important question in, in, in two ways. One, I think it's important because you know, when we read this and we read him in this time, he obviously didn't make it to where we are, are now. Like I imagine he would probably say something different where when you're faced with extant like explicit colonialism, it might seem to make sense to affirm some, you know, firm nationalism. But these are like the the contradictions in negritude, which is to the, the put it in the ways in my head, this affirmation of this sort of cultural singularity, is it a sort of short-term tactic given the current conditions how, uh, as one understands it, or is it meant to be a long-term strategy? Now, I don't know if any of our listeners out there are sort of saying or stands, but I'm going to take the most mainstream reading, which is for him, it seemed like it was a long-term strategy. Mm -hmm. That, you know, he actually thought that there was like this African essence that he wanted to mold institutions um, that would encourage that, that would, you know, keep re reproducing that. I think the record with Cesare is, you know, it's it's a little more mixed. Here, it seems like he he's affirming it. But again, when I think about the philosophical rhetorical level, is it because he's fighting a particular battle? And when the battle is that, you know, you are dealing with, you know, um, a situation in which, you know, your history has been degraded or denied, it's assumed you could not have any agency in this, any critical thinking about what you're doing, that, you know, you need to defend the sort of self-esteem of, we can do this. And so I think it's important to look back on this and say, well, maybe that could be viable then, but why is it not viable now? And I think all of us would agree why it's not viable now. But that, that brings me to the second issue is, why does something like this you know, appeal to a cultural singularity arise in the first place? And you know, we have talked about this, I believe, in the group chat. I think at least partially, I'm obviously hesitating to say what I'm going to say, it reflects a sort of disempowerment. When I think sometimes about um, sort of um, African-American uh, traditions that you know, try to um, repeat certain African cultural habits, even if we didn't have any actual contact with it. I wonder if it's because you feel so cut off from a, a social organization, a social way of life that, you know, you try to invent one, you know, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but you look for a way of living together that will allow you to do something, even if it's not going to work in the long run. I mean, I actually think that that's spot on to what is going on for him because, I mean, at least in part, because he does mention explicitly that nationalism and the culturalism part of it, like there's a, 
obviously all social movements have cultural dynamics, but it's worth distinguishing between a sort of cultural nationalism, obviously, and then the nationalisms that like sought to like nationalize oil and resources and mining and that kind of thing. But he specifically mentions the kind of culturalist aspect of it as a struggle against alienation and in his, and that meant for him in that time against assimilation. So I think that sounds right. No, you can, you can read on the pages, this, the tension that he's constantly working through. And I think Gil, you called it a kind of productive tension. I think it, it really is between a kind of particularism and like a kind of particularist segregationism, cultural segregationism or cultural particularism, and then a kind of universalist assimilation. And that's really what he takes to task with the kind of communist party, right? Is that he says, that, you know, one of the problems with the communist party in France is that it's overly assimilationist. Obviously it's hierarchical and it, for him, he thinks it, it, uh, it repeats a lot of the same kind of colonial tropes about backward people that need to be lifted up and brought along on the, on the progress towards, you know, a liberated future. But you can see him like really working that tension out and he, I, I think it's clear that he wanted to, there's this, there's this appeal to invention, right? And to have the right, for African peoples to have the right to initiate. He, he refers to this, uh, this initiation, right? As a, as a really important concept. But you can see that he struggled to really, like, I, I don't get the sense that he ever settled on even remotely, like what that would look like concretely, right? What it would look like to actually start to generate a kind of cultural and political position, which is which manages to neither reject modernity, right, nor to be assimilated into a kind of European, a European version of modernity, to neither succumb to a kind of walled off particularism, cultural particularism, um, but not to just get kind of, not to just get kind of folded into a universalist communist project that doesn't speak to people. And that's kind of how I see it too, right, is that he sees culture also as a force, as a mobilizing force. And so when he says, you know, one of the problems here in the Caribbean is that it's, it's, harder to mobilize a kind of universal proletarian solidarity here. And I see other avenues for mobilizing solidarity that don't go through the party or don't go through the kind of solidarity, international proletarian solidarity. Uh, and I think we should be free to cultivate those solidarities and to build on them and to take them in places that, that, that Marxism doesn't have a, a way to judge or adjudicate whether they might be productive or might be fruitful. Yeah, the way that I think about it, you know, so, you know, there's reading him in this time, but then, you know, um, maybe we kind of want to pick out like salient questions uh, that we might have now. So I'm thinking about questions around, you know, base building and all of that. In what way should we think about, you know, how to build um, an organization, whether it's a political organization or a social organization? His issue with the French Communist Party is, you know, is that it is so top down. And I think his argument is it actually saps the initiative and you know the energy for meeting particular needs that people are understanding themselves on the ground in Martinique. And that you know if you don't feel like you're a part of the organization that you're just being dictated to, and you know I, I wonder if you all would agree with this, it's really hard to feel connected to an organization where it's not even like nominally you have a say in it. That it's not even listening to, here's how I understand the problems. And so I wonder if he's trying to use culture or let's call it uh, negritude as a way of saying, here's how you can develop an idiom that will get these people engaged in, in this project of political liberation. But if not, that's also gonna bear really small fruit. If you think that, you know, a sort of top-down condescension is going to be a way to mobilize people to be on your side who might not naturally be. By naturally, I mean, they, you know, if you haven't, like, spent 10 years in France like Yo Césaire did, you might wonder, well, why are we taking orders from this party that's all the way in the metropole? Yeah, he's got this line about how, and this is in the letter to Thoreau, about the need for, and the language that he uses is interesting, and I think it gets at this tension between the sort of, the way he's trying to think a concrete universal, the way he's trying to think concrete universality, right? And he says there are things that, like, there needs to be a Caribbean communism, which probably won't be the same thing as a French communism. And then he says, but there won't be a communism unique to each of the colonial countries subject to France as long as the Rue Saint-Georges offices, that is, the offices of the French Communist Party's colonial branch, which is the perfect counterpart of the Ministry of Overseas France on the Rue Audenot, 
persist in thinking of our countries as mission fields or as countries under mandate, right? It just seems so clear when he writes that letter that like his his reasons for being dissatisfied with the form taken by the Communist Party in France at the time are like a thousand percent legitimate. It's completely replicating these sorts of hierarchical structures in which there isn't something like you described, Will, um, an actual engagement with their interaction with the people on the ground trying to build better ways of social life, you know, in light of which, like, yeah, the the only thing to do is say goodbye, um, which is what he did. Yeah. And I think also, uh, and I am genuinely curious about this, that, you know, the other thing that, you know, Cesare seems to be interested in, he's not like the first anti-colonial thinker to, to go this route is he seems also to think that a certain vision of self-esteem or self-worth is a necessary condition for long-term political action. So, you know, the African singularity stuff, it seems to me, and, you know, we had, you know, um, a bit of a discussion, I know, on this on, on the group chat, uh, or I said something along these lines is, you know, he also wants to affirm that we do have a place in this history. And, you know, um, we can get into it if we'd like from what I understand from what, like, you know, some of the material Lillian sent us, like, you know, it actually, you know, takes a lot of detailing of what the relationship between colonialism and slavery and capitalism are. And clearly, you know, they're not doing that type of work. But sometimes I imagine that, you know, when you are someone who has this, uh, this legacy, this colonial legacy, especially in the 50s, you know, when you're dealing with Europe and its capitalism, it's almost like, like that cliche that happens in revenge movies where the protagonist catches up to the villain and you says, this is why I'm going to kill you. And the villain says something like that was the most important day in your life. To me, that was just <laughs> Tuesday. And, you know, this is, you know, it seems like, you know, this is like, you know, Cesare is trying to say, like, no, fuck. Like, you know, we do represent something that we aren't simply just detritus that was carried mm. on by the waves of things that happened elsewhere. Even if empirically... Again, I don't know the, the material as well. It might seem to be the case that to engage in this type of action, you need to feel like, well, am I a part of something or no? And I wonder if that's like, you know, let's put it this way, a cognitive necessity for exercising some sort of political agency that you need to feel like I'm a part of something. That, you know, something I am doing will matter or has mattered. Without that, it's like... Why do anything if you're completely cut off from any sort of social history or something like that? I, th I think that's true. I'll come back to that maybe about if we want the relationship between capitalism and colonialism because I think it's less straightforward, as I've mentioned to the group, than is normally thought. But that doesn't mean that there isn't like a, a strong connection. I think the other part of this is Stalinism. So there's a mm -hmm. way in which... Stalinism is, is complicated because it's a particular way of talking about Marxism, and it's a particular historical configuration. So something that sort of frustrates me in the way that people interpret these debates, which um, I think Gil is right, this is, it's completely legitimate to criticize the CPF and the ways that Césaire does and by the way, he's not the only one. Like, Stalinism didn't work out well in Europe either. So, <laughs> no, no, <indeed. laughs> um, you know what I mean? So, there's that. But Hard there's a, a particular way in which the PCF was actually particularly rigid, mm -hmm. even compared to all other communist parties in Europe at this time. And it has gone into a coalition with the Socialist Party and with the liberals, so he, it's in a government coalition, and it has its own internal stakes for hitching its wagon to this governing coalition in France, and it's also taking its directives from the Comintern, so it's got its own internal politics, and this is something I, I do think is it's worth bringing to the table, that when we're talking about the relationship between different political tendencies, a lot of the time, this discourse about Europe, and I think for rhetorical purposes and moral purposes, it certainly makes sense to me, but it's, I think what I've seen replicated in the writing I've seen about this stuff is that often it, you can start to think about Europe as a homogenous mass and those internal class politics and 
Like the, the common turn is not a normal political configuration. This is a very <laughs> specific dynamic. And the subordination of the PCF at its own expense to the common turn is a very profound turn in French history. It really crippled the French working class movement. The French working the French labor movement is historically weaker than the German labor movement, even the British labor movement, and certainly the Scandinavian one. So this kind of top-down structure, I guess this is a long way of saying that it doesn't work on its own terms, and people were totally right to reject it, but this isn't like, it's not a theoretical necessity of Marxism per se, and I, I don't think that Césaire is saying that, because he says, I'm not denouncing socialism or Marxism, but because that's not what I always see taken up from these writings, like often people are happy to just discard Marxism, what ends up happening is like the, the narrative of Marxism being inherently Eurocentric gets recreated and that those important political details tend to get lost. And I would say that that is a frustration I have about some of the interpretation of this stuff, which doesn't, to me, take away at all from the criticisms he's making. I mean, he says like very scathing things about the unconscious chauvinism, the inveterate assimilationism, which is totally true probably of much of the French left even now, the sort of simplistic faith, which is typical of Stalinism. I mean, all of this like very dogmatic thinking is, is absolutely true. Um, and, they're, and they're compromising politically as well in a very unself-reflective way. And I think when he says we have the, the right to initiative and personality, I actually think that that's a huge claim that goes beyond the context that he's actually referring to about how to organize a socialist movement. Well, so maybe that's really interesting. I think maybe I can connect this back to something that we were starting to talk about a bit before, which is the critique of humanism that he's laying out. And I find this is also the case in people like Feno is not just a one-sided critique that wants us to discard it, right? But wants, I think, to critique it in the name of like a fidelity to a higher humanism, like a true humanism, right? The critique is of uh, the, this European humanist tradition as being a pseudo-humanism. And so like here we can see, I think, all of these, all of these aspects of Stalinism that you just described, right? The sort of top-down, hierarchical, frankly, disempowering kind of form of, of mm -hmm. uh, political and social organization, this weird, naive faith in a specific kind of progress as a historical necessity, these are also part of this dehumanizing tra uh, trajectory, I think. And that he wants us, in fact, to try to develop forms of organization that don't replicate these structures in the name of a humanism to come and which does have universalist aspirations. I think it's important that like, you know, you said like he, you know, explicitly says in the letter where he's resigning, he's like, I don't denounce Marxism. I denounce the use that you people are making of it because it sucks. And you know, he's right. Or that like the last mm -hmm. couple lines of the discourse on colonialism are him saying, this is a quote from the end, it's a matter of the revolution, the one which, until such time as there is a classless society, will substitute for the narrow tyranny of a dehumanized bourgeoisie the preponderance of the only class that still has a universal mission because it suffers in its flesh from all the wrongs of history, from all the universal wrongs, that is, the proletariat, right? Like, this is still a universalist and humanist project and program, I think. I, I think that's yeah. right, and I I think his issue with the with the PCF a lot of the uh, much of the time is that it's a kind of false universalism. Like I don't think yeah. it's the universalism per se like about the communist project or even about the PCF that bothers him, right? It's the fact that it's a mendacious universalism and nowhere is the is the mendacity of that universalism more evident than in their, you know, the, their relationship to the Algerian revolution and to the war in Algeria, mm -hmm. which he takes them to task for having basically given tacit approval of some, I guess, I mean, there were obviously critical voices of of uh, the occupation of Algeria and the war against the Algerian liberation movement. But by and large, there was a lot of quietism at the very least, right, in the PCF. And for him, I think that speaks to that, the mendacity of that universalism and the need to build a genuine universalism, which, which doesn't subordinate, as he says, anti-colonial struggles as part of a larger and more significant whole, but as a, as a battle and as a struggle that is inherently you know, um, is inherently worth fighting and is inherently valuable. I'm going to ask um, a hard question 
because it seems to me the other reason why this, you know, the, the way we describe this top down structure, this mendacious universalism doesn't work is because it also is epistemologically stunting that mm-hmm. there are particular economic, material, um, historical issues that are happening where, wherever you go. Like, you know, let's like you know, be very blunt about like, for instance, you know, certain uh, countries or nations have different resources that they can use to engage the market. So it seems that like at that very sort of immediate abstract level, you know, a top down structure cannot work if you are not, you know, understanding that you know, the conditions and struggle will be different depending on where you go. And the conditions of struggle will be different, you know, depending on the history of where you go by how people understand what they are what, what, what they are doing. And so I think it's important that you know, when we're reading these figures like you know, Césaire or Fanon, like even in Wretched of the Earth, Fanon has this line where he says, you know, something along the lines of the French working class can no longer afford to remain asleep. And yeah. uh, the hard question I ask is, you know, so we're articulating this, this universalism. If we understand capitalism as, you know, even if it's differentiated with how it operates, depending on where it is, according to national laws, et cetera, et cetera requires an international movement but within the international movement there are going to be different strategies tactics and objectives how does one start to align those things Mm -hmm. because it it, it seems in this moment in in the in the 50s with like let's go Césaire and Fanon they're saying it can work but you all are going to have to settle accounts with the exploitation you're dealing with over there and stop projecting onto us what you know needs to be done but at that moment, doesn't that risk a misalignment? Isn't part of the reason of an organization to make sure the pieces are working in tandem together? And so I wonder, is this simply just a practical problem? Is this like a necessary thing that will come up when one is trying to think of longer range struggle? I get it. We're not like, we're definitely not in that type of moment. But in the 50s and 60s, at least the way that I understand it, a lot of these people felt like that moment was coming. You know, not to be romantic about, it, but that the world might be ready to start over. And we know what came next, but that just seems to me, is that simply just like, you know, a contingent problem? Or is that going to be a necessary thing we're going to have to always be attentive to? I think it's going to be a necessary thing to be attentive to always. But I, I think it's worth pointing out some of the historical irony here that the first or the first few communist internationals were, were trying to address this problem. And the Stalinist common turn was a particular thing, but before that, there, there were genuine attempts to have people of different countries come and, and have debates and be like, the Russians put up these political schools. Like, there's fantastic articles, if y'all are interested, about how they, they drew in black Americans to these uh, training schools to like bring them into Russia. And then a big part of a chunk of the black left came back to the United States ever having, after having these experiences in Russia. And there's all kinds of interesting accounts about how they interacted with like the African delegates and the people in these dorms and just, and, and how they, when they ex- felt like their concerns weren't, be t- weren't, weren't being taken seriously, like by the Russians, how they settled grievance complaints. I mean, it's fascin- it's like a fascinating little world in which people like it's hard to even imagine a world in which the political level is that high where like everybody is Mm. kind of on the same page about the problems that need to be addressed and disagreeing about how to solve them to me it sounds like like right now (laughs) we're at a page where we're not even like clear about the problems that need to be addressed like I, I think that people have different very different ideas about what the main obstacles to human freedom are right now and that mm-hmm. is is a big challenge like we're not it's it's i don't know if this is even an answer to your question but that tension exists but i almost feel like we're a step behind that tension at this point in time the the, the total i mean i think we might be kind of coming out of the trough in the u.s of the maybe the the glimmer of a genuine political culture with the the rebirth of a left but in europe you can't say that and you know, I'm, I'm honestly too ignorant about movements elsewhere to, to be able to say what the state of things are. But I just want to put that out on the table, that there's a kind of a genuine crisis of vision and program that I think mm. we're facing right now. Well, he says something similar. I mean, you're right that there is a, a kind of hopeful character, like cautious, pragmatic, provisional optimism that he's espousing in, in some of these lines. But in the letter to, to the PCF, you know, he says that the time in which we live, as he writes, and it's 1956, 
is one characterized by a double failure. And one of them is the obvious failure of capitalism, which we know we know all about. But then there's also the like still ongoing and, and yet fully to be understood failure of socialism as it had existed up till then. And he says, you know, between these two failures, we kind of find ourselves caught at an impasse. And I feel like there's a way in which maybe to, to, to get to what you're saying, Lillian, that like I, I feel as though that that tension is that impasse is the one that we're still faced with in, in, in profound ways. I, what's that, that line, right? Like the, the old is dying and the new can't yet be born. You know, now's the time of monsters. I mean, to that, I, w- I would actually just add, I think nationalism is now in that bucket of failures, like um, left-wing mm-hmm. nationalisms that flourished in um, the Middle East and North Africa, in the rest of Africa. I mean, when he mentions African socialism in Latin America, I mean, even most recently is the pink tide, a sort of social democratic nationalism, these have not been able to be successful. And I think that the reason I said crisis of vision is that we have a generation of people that is increasingly skeptical of capitalism. They're warming to socialism, but are skeptical of class politics. I mean, I think that's generally true on the left, that we have a left that is skeptical of class politics. And nationalism continues to present itself as this other like more identity friend- friendly alternative but mm. i think there needs mm. to be an account of its of its failures and not because i'm not sympathetic to those projects as they were at the time but whether or not they can address the increasing globalization of, of capital the entrenched interests of ruling classes across the world and mm-hmm. so on and so forth you know like the fact that we can't even tax our fucking capitalist classes to me like like i think that's the big problem yeah well i, I think in uh, in the absence of kind of direct national occupation the luster of of nationalism is kind of reduced right and which i think brings us to something i did want to discuss which is more you know the question of neocolonialism and what to make of this in the contemporary mm. moment because there is at the at the beginning of the discourse a kind of, I don't want to call it optimism because it's more of, I think, I think it's more of an explanatory claim, a diagnosis of Europe and of capitalism and of colonialism as exhausted, like done, mm. it's defeated, it's, it's out of energy, it's on its last legs. And so reading it in, you know, it, reading it in 2021 and just thinking like, damn, I, I really wish that that had been true. But look at how wily <laughs> those forces, both colonial forces and capitalist forces working in tandem Right through the elaboration of a more financialized and geopolitical neocolonialism, look at how robust and intact they still are. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, in some ways, you know, you, Lillian, you mentioned that there, you know, we're not even clear about what the obstacles are. And I'm curious what you think about what ways the obstacles are different, and, w- and in what ways they're actually still pretty similar and actually still the same. Can I just jump in real quick sure, because sure, I then. love the language of you know exhausted because I actually have a slightly different reading of what he is saying there. Okay. I, I you know I think there is. A, there is an optimism, sure, but I don't think we necessarily need him to be understanding him as saying like so. Its end is imminent. I think what he is saying because mm-hmm. he has you know this line about you know sort of uh, what is it you know a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization. Yeah, I think that's his understanding of exhaustion, which is that even up to 2021, I think in in a way we see how exhausted this economic system is because it Mm -hmm. keeps posing problems that it is either unwilling or I think you were probably aligned with this unable to solve. And yet it's not dead. Yeah. And I think he can say, yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think he can say it's exhausted, but until a a requisite force can move it, Mm. this exhausted thing is going to keep carrying on. And so to the question of neocolonialism, I I wonder if there's a way of thinking, you know, as we said, the story is complicated between colonialism and capitalism and all of that. But I think, you know, we can say it did rearrange the relations of, you know, the global world in a really significant way. You know, let me put it this way, you know. Who still owns most of the stuff around the world? You know, with um, global financial organizations, I think uh, in in Nigeria, multinational corporations own most of the oil production that happens there, and that's really important. The fact that Francophone West Africa still uses a currency that's controlled out of Paris, right? The CFA. Yes. And so I wonder if, like, what's hard about it is, you're right, nationalism hits different when you literally have the the imposing power right there. But mm-hmm. now it seems, as, as at least in a very explicit way, that that's over. That's not here. And so I wonder if we're also dealing with there's, you know, a deep mystification complexity 
about our time, of you know, understanding where the power is, how it works, and all of that. I wouldn't even pretend to be smart enough to know all the ways that global capital works, how it hides its shell corporations, where it stashes its money. And so, in the sense, what was nice, I, I, the 50s and 60s were extraordinarily violent and bloody. That, like, don't get me wrong. But if it seemed as if there was a real clarity on you know, what the lines were, even mm-hmm. if the politics are complicated. I wonder if you all think that we are even living in time for like a lot of the, let's call it the political culture. That clarity is really hard to come by, which I'm trying to describe as the, the lack of vision. What is it that we're fighting mm-hmm. for? And what are the strategies that we would need to do in order to get that thing that we are fighting for? And if we can misapprehend that because the game has changed in, in some fundamental ways. You know, I get it, more things change, more they stay the same, et cetera, et cetera, but the game has changed. I mean, I think that that lack of clarity is kind of on purpose. I mean, I think that a lot of what neocolonialism involves is the discovery of a more efficient because easier to mask form of financial and political, economic, and even military control. Like France's relationship to, you know, the, the policy of France Afrique, which is basically still an official policy by which France exercises an enormous amount of financial control, an enormous amount of political control. It brings its military in and it's uh, like in Mali, for example, like just two days ago, there were anti-French military protests in, uh, in Mali, um, in Bamako. And so, but I, I think it's the discovery of a more efficient system where instead of it being a kind of direct occupation, now you've got French oil companies like Total or its banks or whatever, which have exclusive agreements which allow them to, you know, still have access to those natural resources, but without all of the cost and all of the kind of uh, the direct antagonism of actual occupation. So I think that that obscurity of the problem and of the obstacles is deliberate because it becomes a lot harder to kind of locate and fight and to engage in a kind of revolutionary struggle against an enemy that is so much more diffuse, right? That, and that is like really just, you know, that is sustained by international institutions like the International Monetary Fund and now even, you know, China's Belt and Road Project, which does the same, you know, they learn from the IMF and they do a similar kind of debt leverage form of control over many countries in Africa and elsewhere. And last thing I'll just say real quick, because I don't think this will be controversial, but I think it's important to say it's important to like really heed local analyses of specific, like say African politics, because Mm -hmm. a lot of them will say, no, no, in a lot of these countries, there is a ruling class that is quote unquote indigenous, that is corrupt. That is not doing what I think the Césaires and all that imagined nationalism would do. Now, we know Fanon and Wretched of the Earth, he saw this you know, national bourgeoisie coming who were going to betray it and all of that. But you know, I, I, you know, I don't think we should bracket that out. I'm not saying we, we need to you know, necessarily focus on it. But obviously, that's a big reason why nationalism in some ways seems like it's not as viable of a strategy. Agreed. Well, we could go back to like one of the things that we've said in, in so many contexts already on this podcast which is that it's just a mistake, perhaps, to presuppose that there is a unity of direction that the nationalist struggle would have to unfold Mm. uh, towards, right? And so like that, there is this sort of concatenation of power on a national stage or the formation of a national culture might have been possible for that to move in a more revolutionary direction. But as it happens, in almost every case that I can think of, it was almost immediately co-opted in the ways that you're describing by multinational capital interests and so on. I was thinking, too, about like, you know, you were mentioning some of these sort of neo-colonial exercises of power. And Federici talks about how Mozambique is like a sort of paradigm case for how like the IMF and structural adjustment programs make it impossible, basically, for anything like authentic liberation for this for this country to, to, to take place. Where instead what we get are increasing relations of, again, economic, it's silent economic dependency and, and, and the creation of new relations of dependency within the international economic order, mm. which don't any longer seem to require the kind of overt militaristic colonialism of the middle of the 20th century, but which are just as politically uh, disenfranchising um, for all of that. And this is the sort of, like you were saying, like subtler version of this more efficient kind of neo-colonial system that makes it harder to identify the enemy, right? There's like a point in the in the discourse where Cesar is like, well, who are the enemies? Like, who are the enemies that we need to name? And he says, well, it's everyone who mm-hmm. performing their functions in the sordid division of labor for the defense of Western bourgeois society split up the forces of progress, right? And this is the sort of cheerleaders for 
I don't know, this new internationalist order that still sings the same songs that he's already like, you know, pointing out when like Renan says it are messed up about how this is the great civilizing function of the extension of market economies to places that were formerly under colonial rule. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, where's the, where's, the, where's the liberation there? I'm sorry. So one of my projects is to try to demystify what capitalism is. And my opinion about this, and this is all I'll say, is that there is a real theoretical hostility on the intellectual and academic left to thinking specifically and systematically about capitalism. Everything is always capitalism is bad because it enables things that are not actually itself capitalism. So capitalism is bad because it needed colonialism. Capitalism is bad because it's racist. Capitalism is bad because it oppresses women. Now, it does, in fact, do all of these things, but we have a left that has lost the critical capacities to think about political economy. And I'm sure that our listeners will know that I am just a complete broken record about this. But I think it's important because the relationship between capitalism and colonialism, as I said, is not at all clear. I mean, the reasons capitalism needs colonialism are not clear from a scient social scientific perspective, like what the structural tendency of a capitalist economy is to expand geopolitically. Now, it does need to expand growth, sure, but whether why it would need to take military or political actions to secure growth is, again, um, not clear. Lenin and Rosa Luxemburg, they tried different theses, monopoly capitalism, um, underconsumption. These things are, are easy at this point to, to dispel. The idea that capitalism culminates to the point of monopoly such that it undermines any and all competition so it has to geopolitically secure certain industries. This, is, this might be true for certain extractive industries, but it's not true generally. So there's a fundamental ambiguity and why capitalism needs imperialism. And one of the things that you see over time is that actually with the emerging capitalist development in Europe and the onset of social democracy after the war, you see a contraction of the colonial project sharply. Britain can't maintain the empire and support the mm -hmm. social welfare state at the same time. And we have a mythology on the left that is capitalism needed colonialism in order to develop. It's a precondition, which means all of that wealth that's circling around in Europe was built on the back of the colonial project. And therefore, social democracy was only possible because of the colonial project. But what you actually see is the opposite, that in order for capital to be able to maintain its growth rate, they had to contract the state. And so they had to hand it off to the Americans who could finance an imperial project because the American working class can't fucking tax its capitalist class. It's weaker historically. So when we think about what are the obstacles on countries that used to be colonies and that are no doubt subject to all kinds of subordination to international financial institutions and so on, there needs to be an understanding of why it is that the, the domestic political situation isn't able to put up a, a real fight against this. And one of the reasons is that the ruling classes of the, the, the crony capitalists, the corrupt dictators and everything else, they have an interest in it. They like having their currency pegged to the euro. Like the, this, this mm -hmm. works for them. They want... Mm -hmm the American Federal Reserve to be the, the currency, the, the people that, because they have low interest rates, they, they like being able to take that out from the American Federal Reserve. So to me, the, pro the problem, I, I'm not going to convince people who don't see this ambiguity in the way I do, but I'll just put this on the table, that the problem is thinking in terms of nations. Like when you say France is doing this, nations don't do things. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, th like nations are statistically bounded like regional, they're, they're not entities. So the so, need to so think- So we can be more- Sorry, yeah. like I it just, yeah. there's a way in which like, I'm not an economist and I'm not a social scientist either, but when we ask about what are the obstacles for people, you're gonna have different answers to that based on how you think about like the unit of analysis. And if it's still like nation states versus nation states, then you're gonna have one answer and, you know, and, and then I think class interests are a, a different answer. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue is clearly international capital and the grip that it still continues to have on many, you know, post so-called post-colonial countries. But to be more specific, like in the case of, you know, with France and Britain, it's true that it became way too expensive to maintain the colonies. But the de Gaulle regime, which were the ones that instituted the CFA, were very explicit about the fact that it's the same old story. We still need access to resources, labor and markets. And so they saw a set of kind of financial institutions and 
military support for for regimes that were going to be favorable to French capital's interests. It doesn't matter that it's really French. It matters that it's, I guess, that it's Total, like the oil company, and BNP Paribas or whatever, some French bank. But they were also coordinating, and they still continue to coordinate with the United States and the CIA, who are, I don't know, maybe if you want to put it in a kind of causal order, like let's just say that then they are instruments then for international capital, which, you know, those nation states, that they are instruments for international capital, which still needs the resources, the labor and the markets uh, in those countries to be secure for firms, which, again, maybe they ha just happen to be headquartered in Canada and France and, uh, and the United States. Does that kind of respond to what you were saying? Sort of. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I also think extractive industries are, are kind of geopolitically specific. Mm. My broader point, even if you don't buy my social theoretical analysis, which you don't have to because I'm a philosopher and I don't know anything. But um, I mean, I think I mostly do. The, 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 the payoff <laughs> of thinking specifically about capitalism is to understand the constraints on freedom as they actually exist and not in abstractions of what you kind of hope will be what you kind of hope will be useful and i think there is a resistance to thinking specifically about this because pre-capitalist colonialism had a very different political character and the separation between the state and the economy under capitalism means that capital it depends on like the political costs of going to war and and so on mm -hmm. and populations are less and less likely to go to war so i think that is a part of why it seems so so diffuse and ambiguous, but it's it's not actually that diffuse and, and ambiguous. And there's a way in which people kind of call on the colonial history to make sense of concrete conditions right now, which is hmm. understandable, but it can also distort, again, the specificity of what is happening currently, which is what we need to understand. Like, I think that the thing that the American population can do that would disable American imperial ambitions abroad is to be able to tax their capitalist class and decrease the political resources that they have to launch those wars. But instead, we talk mm. about it in kind of other circu circuitous ways, like, you know, how do we be both anti-capitalist and anti-colonial? But if it's the case that, like, if you, the political costs that you can put on them are to make them contract the state, because right now they're able to socialize the costs of, in, of imperialism. They're able to privatize the benefits and socialize the costs. If that's mm -hmm. true, then mm -hmm. the, the most anti-imperial thing that you can do is fucking fight your fucking capitalists in your domestic economy. And, and you don't need, and to get people on board with that project, and this is important, you don't need a lot of other ideological stuff going on. You just need to ask them to fight for themselves. And that's different than being like, oh, atone for your sins or whatever. Not that they shouldn't, but I'm saying that, like, that your vision of the political project changes if you kind of understand the constraint that you need to overcome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And yeah. I don't know if this like is added on to or simply follows. But I think when I think of the, you know, the problem, with, you know, we can call it neocolonialism and you know, asking the question, who still owns the things and all of that? And who gets to make decisions about particular policies where? I find it hard to not think about not the on the way, but the ongoing climate apocalypse. And so when you said, you know, like, you know, Europe contracting, like it was too expensive, what came to my mind is when people are going to be forced to move, especially in hotter countries that haven't been furnished the resources to deal with those changes that the climate is going to bring. And also, yes, we should probably ask questions about who is producing the carbon dioxide, the elements that are causing the plant to warm. I don't think it is pessimistic to think that Europe will contract. You know, I think we've already seen like Italy or other countries have like, you know, let migrants die in the, the Dead Sea and all of that. And so Medicaid, I think in yeah. some ways, you know, I, you know, I know I said as a joke about the cliche of like that was the most important day for us. It was a Tuesday. But, you know, increasing parts of the planet are going to find themselves superfluous. And the, the argument is going to be, given these objective constraints, we cannot support these people moving here. And I think that should cause us to reflect on, well, what type of economic system of relations and power do we have that makes that an objective constraint such that political strategies of you know locking down borders become almost the, the rational solution? The listeners can't see, but I'm doing quotations. I you know Quotations <laughs> around rational and all of that. Which brings us back to, in some ways to Césaire, is that I think at the rhetorical philosophical level, Cesare is saying that the way things are, they're rotted out from the inside. 
you know, it's only so long it's going to work out for you at the expense of other people before it's going to cost you. And so, and I wonder if that argument still holds, even though certain European countries have obviously a better social welfare system than the United States. But I don't know. I don't know if everyone is doing great, you know, uh, if you are in, you know, the working class around the world. And I wonder if that's like the sort of spirit of the discourse on, on colonialism, which is these set of relations are sick. He uses this language of health. They are not in the long run, even going to be productive for your life. And so, you know, we need to change the terms on which we think are natural ways of living. Yeah. I mean, I think that one of the things he saw that a lot of the European left didn't see, particularly the left liberals, you know, the people who would later become the sort of EU ideologues, you know, the kind of people who are like, the class conflict problem has been solved. You know, now there's other steering mechanisms, a little Habermas shade over there. But um, <laughs> we've never thrown shade at him. That's weird. <laughs> there's always I think room for that. our first time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's a way in which I feel like their the intellectual tendencies, like he kind of saw the writing on the wall. Like there are people who are supposed to be all progressive, but they believe too much in their own understanding of progress and not just for the world but for for themselves and he talks about this internal ideological inability to solve problems that capitalism puts up and i'm interested in that like what makes it so difficult for people to see problems as problems under capitalism like ellen wood writes about this where it's like there's no society that has been able to mask these class relations so effectively and even when people start to see them they're pissed off they want to tax the rich they want health care they, they want to defund the police these things happen but articulating them as a set of class relations is almost like despite that that's that that's a Ideology that it takes so much more to get people to see the structural inequality, you know, most and mm. that makes me think that part of the masking dynamic of capitalism is, I think, what he was saying in relation to, to colonialism ideologically. And at the time in the colonies, of course, that mask was off. I think part of my question, just to clarify for listeners, like my question about being specific about capitalism is what happens when the mask is on around the world? Because capitalism universalizes and it globalizes. Ideologically, what does that mean for a political program and how we argue with people about what the problem is? I really love that um, because, you know, especially the language of how we argue about that. It seems to me Cesare, he was trying to change how we make our arguments, or he was trying to change how he was envisioning Martinicans should make their arguments. He was trying to say the terms that you were setting for the debate actually bracket out all of these relevant phenomena, and they aren't even you know um, strong enough to form coalition, form a political constituency. And so I find myself thinking a lot, and sometimes, or is that like too super structural? But how we frame our arguments, I think, matters if what happens in organizing a coalition is eventually going to be something about speaking to other people, saying, here's mm -hmm. what I see are the problems. Here is how I can clarify. Here's how I can hook into what your my be in intuitions are nice. and you know, take the mask off. And you'll say like, well, it seems like actually this is what's going on here. And what Cesare really wanted to do is just, you know, say our political discourse needs to change because right now it's defunct and it obscures more than it clarifies. Well, one of the ways in which that's true and like the symptoms that he's identifying, too, is that you get all of these accounts for the persistence of these problems that are cashed out solely in terms of ideas. Right. And so, like, you have this idea, as he says, and he's got it. He's got it. He's brought his receipts. Right. Um, it's Manoni. Yes. It's uh, it's Guru. Yo, and by the Tempel. way, Manoni, he is such trash. Even for non trash, <laughs> I know, it's ass great. And it gets black skin, white mask. Yeah. him. But this is, you know, the idea of this dependency complex of the so called inferior peoples, the colonized, or the idea of this like Bantu culture or ontology, or even this idea of like a tropical climate having some like essential relationship. And he's like, those are all really great ideas. What about like the bank? And like the whips and like the the taxes, like, you know, these actual material things that are that are the, the true sort of like locus of the, the exercise of this power and which conveniently falls away from a lot of these, you know, 
more idealist ways of, of, like you said, framing even the argument of the discussion in the first place. Yeah, and I keep saying this is the last thing because I don't want to like you know, keep forcing you all to stay on here. <laughs> but I think this is something I'd like to talk about at, at, at a later date, which is you know, you know the uh, relationship between you know let's say rhetoric and you know political constituency. The reason why I'm thinking about this, is like you know, in the group chat, we keep saying like you know, Cesare, he's like such an amazing writer and all of that. And I wonder if that he that's you know, that's not ancillary. You know, he is trying to not just provoke you know, an abstract emotion, but he's trying to draw you in, to, in in this idea of like, this is a thing worth fighting. And, you know, this is, you know, even though obviously, you know, in some ways he was overly optimistic, but he was understanding that I'm trying to make a certain population come alive. And the reason why I'm thinking about that is, you know, I think about, you know, Malcolm X. He wasn't like he was a... Um, I, I like Malcolm X. It wasn't like he was a sophisticated theorist of the histories of, of X. But he had a way of using his rhetoric of trying to create a constituency that would be open to different types of critiques. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about later Malcolm X. I, I get the, the earlier stuff. Yeah, the Nation of Islam. Yeah, I'm not going to defend that. <laughs> and so I sometimes wonder when I think like Bernie Sanders, you know, it wasn't just his analyses. I think some of it was like how he tried to like speak to a people speak them into existence by saying things like we and you and all of that. And not I don't know me, how us. immaterial. Yeah. Right. Not me. If, like, if, okay. if he had only had the poetic power of Cesare, he'd be president right now. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I know you said that as like a conflict, but now I realize that's like kind of a dunk on what I'm saying. Cause it can seem like I'm only saying if only we had the well, rhetoric, right? <laughs> no, I was only semi joking. Yeah. So I just think that that's another part of what he's trying to do, which is he's yeah. trying to speak a political constituency into mm -hmm. being, speak a belief into being. Oh, well, I think that does it for us today. New episodes of What's Left of Philosophy come out every two weeks, wherever you get your podcasts. Please like and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter at Left of Phil. If you like what we're doing, consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash left of philosophy. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks.